All right, next we're going to have Dr. Groshans talk about proton therapy. He's a well-recognized expert in management of uh, skull-based and spine chordomas using proton therapy. I apologize if I start coughing. Uh, one of my kids passed something along to me. Um, <clears throat> so um, I've noticed that we all have something in common. We like to show pictures of the medical center. Um, uh, this is MD Anderson. Um, it's a big place. Um, it's a, it can be kind of a scary place, um, especially if you have to have a consult with a radiation oncologist. Um, you know, you think about surgery, you think about chemotherapy, but there's something visceral about radiation. It's a scary word. Um, associated with these um, dangerous pictures. Um, we're trying to make it less scary, um, and one of the ways we do it is um, proton therapy. Um, this is the what you got from the Cordoma Foundation showing where you should park at. Um, directly in front is actually the, the proton therapy center, so it's literally right next door to us. Um, so this is my drive into work every day. Um, I come in. I, I stay away from the main campus. Typically, I am a proton doctor, um, and it's nice, quiet. It's a, it's a very friendly place. Um, we started um, proton therapy in 2006, so I just want to give you a little bit of history lesson um, why we started and where we're going. Um, when we started in 2006, we were one of only five centers, um, so it's not been widely available. Um, but we jumped in because we think that it has a real potential to improve um, outcomes for patients with uh, cordoma and other tumors. Um, some very basic physics. Um, um, protons stop. Photons, or x-rays, do not. Um, Protons are little charged particles, so I kind of say they're like ping pong balls. Um, you spin them, and at some point they're going to stop. Um, and they deposit all their dose without delivering any dose beyond that. Whereas photons are kind of little packets of energy that um, pass through the body, depart some energy, but then continue to pass through the body and eventually will um, exit the body. Um, so proton therapy, it's been a, a controversial thing, but the reason why there's been so much investment in it um, can be summed up by a very famous um, um, radiation physicist. Um, if you don't treat a normal tissue, you can't have a side effect in that normal tissue. Um, this is a picture of a brain tumor patient. Um, on your left is a photon plan um, with dose all over, um, and on the other side is um, a proton plan, um, which you're sparing a lot of the brain. Um, Fast forward to a couple years ago, or last year, 2016, there's been an explosion in the number of proton therapy centers, and it's because people really believe that this is going to be a, a better therapy. Um, it's not come without controversy. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures from the New York Times. Um, people can see this building that cost $150 million to build, and they can point a finger at it and say, this is driving health care costs up. Um, it, I, it's very different than, a, say, a new drug um, that might not be as effective, but could cost far more than that. Um, and the reason is, it, like I said, it's expensive. Um, this is a picture of one of our gantries. It's what we use to direct the beam around. Um, and down in the, the bottom, you can see the scale. Here's one of the engineers from Hitachi um, during the construction of our gantry. So this is an expensive thing to build just because of the, the sheer magnitude of it. Um, I think why it's been so controversial is um, patients that we've treated historically. Um, I don't treat these patients, but you know, a lot of proton centers do. Things like prostate cancer, where it's a, a very indolent disease. Some patients will die of their disease, but a lot of patients will die with their disease. Um, it's not as aggressive as um, a tumor like a chordoma, per se. Um, but I think for proton therapy, um, one of the success stories has really been chordomas. Um, we talk a little bit about insurance approval. Um, and some people have a hard time getting insurance approval. I have never had a patient with chordoma denied because I think the evidence is pretty substantial that this is a, a preferred treatment. Um, this is just some of our own um, results that we've published here as well um, uh, with excellent local control and progression-free survival. Um, so why would chordoma be such a success story? Um, it's really because you have to give very high doses of radiation. And the ability to stop that beam, stop that radiation beam, allows you to spare some of the normal tissues which are right around these tumors. And therefore, you can deliver this higher dose to a larger region. And I think that's, that's what's important. Um, this is um, a patient that Dr. DeMonte showed already. Um, you have a very large target volume here in red. Um, these tumors can grow very slowly. Um, and can get really quite large. Um, and you have to cover all that. Um, anywhere where the surgeon was, um, you need to give at least some radiation dose there to, to hopefully sterilize any micrometastatic disease. Um, and it's, it gets to be um, tricky stuff. Um, you have the brain stem right there in blue. 
um, the optic chiasm there in pink, uh, which is the vision pathways. Um, there's also other sides of the brain, the, the temporal lobes, which are involved in learning and memory. A lot of um, high value real estate, I, I call it. Um, and you know, proton therapy, we think, is really ideally suited um, to be able to give these very high doses of radiation. And you really got to give it to the whole tumor area. Um, you can't skimp on it. There's evidence that if you do skimp on it and you start to lose coverage, um, it's much more likely that the tumor is going to recur. Um, so just a little bit about the patient experience. Um, again, it's kind of a scary thing. Um, for skull-based tumors, um, this is what a lot of people are, are you know, scared about is that you're kind of strapped down to the table there. Um, it's really not that bad, though. Um, uh, even patients that say they're anxious about it, once we um, move forward with things, um, everything tends to fall into place. Um, we do have new tools, um, even at our Proton Center here. Um, this is a picture of our MRI simulation uh, unit that we now have, um, which has really um, proven, at least in my hands, to be a really valuable tool. Um, what we used to do is, after we do that CAT scan with the mask on, is we'd take the MRI and electronically fuse it um, to the, the CAT scan. And the MRI really shows us in, in greater detail anywhere where the tumor could have been in all the normal tissues so we can know what to treat and what not to treat. But there's, anytime you're fusing something like that, there's always a little wiggle room. There could be a little bit of air. Um, but if you do that MRI with that mask on, there's really no air, and so you can be much more precise, I think, um, in how your um, your confidence in your your treatment planning. Um, what I always like to highlight is that we, as physicians, especially radiation physicians, stand up here and take credit for things like proton therapy. It's really not us. Um, there's a whole team behind us that really supports us. Um, this is a picture. I, I walked downstairs yesterday and started taking pictures of people, and they all looked at me. Um, but this is our our dosimetrist. Um, they uh, um, are the people that help us develop these initial radiation plans. You can see here Tyler, he's one of our young dosimetrists. He's very excited about having his picture taken. Um, but I think really the most important people are our physicists. Um, this is um, really quite a challenging thing. This is Ron Zhu, one of our, our senior radiation physicists, and I really give them the credit for helping develop these treatment plans. Um, anyway, as a patient, when you go in, um, you don't see this giant gantry, um, but you're right in the middle of it here. Um, and you're laying on the treatment table, and the beam is coming um, in from around the sides. Um, in our center, um, there's a couple things that we've um, you know, become famous for. One was being one of those first five proton centers in the US, and we've been really the most active. Um, but way back there in, in 2005, 2006, um, what we did was we invested in a new technology called scanning beam proton therapy. And I want to talk just a little bit about that. Um, we kind of went all in. Um, at that point, there was only one other center in the world. Um, it was in Sweden um, that had ever done scanning beam proton therapy center. So we were the second um, in the world to do this. Um, and what is scanning beam? Um, regular proton therapy um, is kind of like a big can of spray paint. You have a big beam and you shape it with hardware on the sides. Um, with scanning beam proton therapy, you use a small beam of protons, but you change the energy and um, use magnets to scan it around so you're kind of painting it in, so it's more like an airbrush approach. Um, and what that really allows us to do um, is if you have a tumor here, um, you deliver one spot, but then you can continue to paint in those spots um, as you move through the tumor. And what that really allows you is conformality, so you get that radiation dose that's really shaping right around where the tumor is, and you get it not only at the far edge of the tumor, but also at the, the edge that's closer to where the beam is going in. Um, now, I, I'm a clinician, but I also have a laboratory as well, um, and we're interested in, you know, is there a unique biologic effect of proton therapy? Um, this is a patient that escaped Dr. Rines. Um, he was a um, very, he was old, um, kind of debilitated, um, and he wasn't really a surgical candidate, but he came to us, um, he was having a lot of pain, and we said, okay, we have to do something. Um, so we treated him with proton therapy. And about six months later, he came back. Um, the original tumor um, is shown here in red. Um, the tumor that he had at six months was very different, though. That whole front half of the tumor had essentially melted away, which isn't something we typically see with chordoma, something that a response that quickly or that asymmetrically. Um, why could that be? Um, what we do in the lab is we look at you know, how effective is a proton beam compared to a photon beam. 
Um, and what we're learning now is that, you know, at that far edge of the proton beam where all those protons are stopping, it actually has more of a biologic effect. So there's more cell killing at that far edge of the proton beam. Um, this is a cell survival curve that we like to show where we're looking at different points along the beam, um, and those far points are over here with the, the black and the orange, where more cells are being killed at even a lower radiation dose. And so what we can do is, in collaboration with our radiation physics colleagues, we can go back and look where were those far regions of the beam. It turns out that they were right in that area that melted away. Um, and so we think that this is something that we can capitalize upon. Um, now, if you, if you want to think about how this might be, um, you can look at what happens in an individual radiation particle, what damage does it do? And you can look at this atomic level. Um, for um, x-rays, um, they kind of deposit some dose, shown here in circles, um, but they can kind of shoot off to different, different areas. If you look at the far edge, or that, that distal edge where the protons start to stop, um, you can see the circles here. And they're much more clustered, they're much more compact, and there's much more of them. Um, and so how can we do that? Again, if we go back and use that scanning beam proton therapy, we can now start to play around with where the proton beam is stopping and come in from different angles and try and put all that energy right into where the tumor is. And um, this is what we're doing. Um, we're actually starting this um, at first, um, of all places, in pediatric patients, but I think Cordoma is really an ideal place to, to move into with this as well. Um, now, just a word, um, you know, we talk about drug development. We talk about you know, exploring new markers. Um, we're exploring new radiation types as well. Um, let's think again about the energy deposition and how damaging it is. Um, we have protons, and now I'm going to throw something in here called carbon ions. If protons are like ping pong balls, carbon ions are like bowling balls. Um, they are very biologically damaging and impart an uh, enormous amount of, of dose locally. Um, and if you look at what happens, uh, you know, at the DNA level, if you have an X-ray track or even a proton track, you nick some of the DNA every once in a while. If you have a carbon ion track, that DNA is just broken in half, and there's no way the cell can fix it, and that cell is destined to die. Um, now, it turns out, um, you know, way back in the 1970s, we actually used to use ions like this, um, but we've kind of fallen behind the rest of the world. Um, our colleagues in Japan um, are actively treating patients, um, including cordoma patients, with carbon ion therapy. There are now centers in Germany, um, in Austria, and elsewhere throughout Europe that have these um, carbon ion centers as well. Um, and we are um, hoping um, that we can adopt this technology here as well. And there are several other centers in the U.S. that are looking at this as well. Um, this is, again, we are over here um, in this area of the building. Um, here is the existing proton center. Um, we're currently in, in talks with different vendors. Um, we need to expand and improve our proton therapy um, capacity, so we'll more likely than not build a second, newer proton center, um, and potentially a carbon ion center as well, because we want to be able to use these different type of radiations, and we want to be able to have an individual patient potentially even look at their tumor and say, well, which patient should be better treated by photons, protons, or carbon ions? Um, so with that, um, I'll kind of close um, on a, you know, my drive into work every day. Um, one day I was driving in and I, I saw this little sign here that someone had put up, so I had to stop and take a picture of it. Um, it said, life insurance for cancer survivors. So I, I've never called that number, but um, someone believes in, in what we're doing and we're, we're trying to make the, the best outcomes we can. So I appreciate it.